Repent from all your sin, cause this he has commanded. If he would enter in, and then if you should live a hundred years below, well, you know you've got it settled. Could you settle that long ago, long ago, long ago? Yes, the old account was settled long ago. And the record's clear today, cause he washed my sins away. Yes, the old account was settled long ago. and every one of you for coming along this Sabbath morning and also to Mervyn for inviting me uh, to give a little talk on the work in Romania, Moldova, and Ukraine and to bring a little word. So I'm going to read from Psalm 46, first few verses. Psalm 46. God is a refuge and strength, a very pleasant help in trouble. Therefore will not be fear through the earth be moved, and through the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake and the swelling thereof, there is a river, the streams thereof shall make glad, the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of God most high. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right and early. The heathen rage, the kingdoms were moved. He honors his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Verse 10 says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. We thank God for the reading of his own precious word. Let us pray before the children's talk. Heavenly Father, we thank thee again as we come into your presence. Uh, Lord, this Sabbath morning, we thank you for your goodness to us. And we thank you for our health and for our strength and for all the things that you have supplied us with that we take for granted. Even the air that we breathe, our heartbeat, everything, and the food that we eat. And many in our land and across the world have very little of these things. And we thank and praise thee for it. Most of all, we thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who left the realms of glory, came to die on a cross and to shed his precious blood. Father, not only did he die, but he rose victorious over hell, Satan, and the death. And Lord, he lives forevermore at your right hand in heaven. Father, our desire is that those who do not know him as Savior, that they would ask them into their heart, just as like a little child would come and have faith and believe and know that they're saved and ready for that day, no matter what happens, that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and you can live in heaven all eternity. Lord, what a privilege we have. What a joy it is. What peace it brings. And Father, we give thee all the praise and the honor. Remember each and every person gathered in here today, each and every, every family, we'd ask that you'll bless them on their take for them. Lord, whatever is on their heart, whatever they need, we know nothing about it. We don't know the troubles they've been through. We don't know what they have come up against for hospital or for sickness or burdens or financial. But Lord, you know everything. And may they just open their heart and bring it to thee and ask for your help. For you alone are the one who can help in times of need and bring peace to a troubled heart. So Father, we just pray that you'll bless them. Bless Mervyn today as he's in holidays. We ask that your blessing may be upon him and strengthen him in these days. And Father, we give thee all the praise, the honor, and glory, for it's in your precious name we ask it. Amen. What do you ask, Jude? Thank you very much, Greg. I'm going to turn to Psalm 46 just to bring a few thoughts, and then we'll go into the PowerPoint. Uh, a few things I've just as I looked at it, as we pointed out some things. Our first verse says, God is a refuge and strength, a very pleasant help in trouble. You know, it says there in verse 1, God, that's the main thing, God is our help. 
And even in the Genesis when it started, God was mentioned at the start. God and all. In creation, he created everything. God is our help. God created the world and everything in it. People say different today, but still, God created all. And if you think on it, no man could do it. He swung this earth into being. You look at the sun, precise on the second. It rises, it sets every day for all the time that eternity, all the time that he has made it right through. The sun has never failed to rise. The moon has never failed to shine. And the stars in heaven, the billions that no man can number. That is the God we serve. And yet he's interested in each and every one of you and in our hearts. God is our, that's individual, that's each and every one of us. Refuge, in time of trouble, if you need him, if you want, turn to him. Many people try different things in life, but you know they all come back to the same thing, that God is a refuge. There's no one else who can help you. In times of trouble, people can be good, people can say this, can that, they'll come for a certain length of time, but then they will leave. But if you're in, like, a situation, when I was there in Ukraine there at the end of June and beginning of July, everybody is in more or less the same problem. So one hasn't the time for all, and who have you to turn to? No one but Christ. They haven't time. So God is our refuge and strength, and also our help in time of trouble. But, you know, if he's our help in time of trouble, surely you should give him your life. Open your heart and ask him into your heart and you'll always have him as your friend every day. He's one that'll stick closer than a brother. And best of all, you'll have no fear the day, whatever happens to you, when you close your eyes or whether tragedy comes your way, be absent from the body and present with the Lord. God is all we have to hold to today. Our world has changed in this last 15, whatever years, and changing fast. It's changing that fast that before you could have very little change, years and years ago. But it's changing that fast that people don't remember what the last thing changes was. And it's a tragedy. Financially, everything is gone. Everything is gone. People have no peace. People have no time for all. People are looking for this, looking for money, looking to give this. What they think that can be found in money. And as we see, we're heading for another recession and and many will be sad because they're going to lose many things. But God is still the same. He'll never change. He's the one that we can lean on. He is our place of safety to hide in, the psalmist says here. And who can help when all is against us? When the tide is up, when the water is coming, when things are happening around you day after day after day, when things come in and you don't want to tell anybody what's happening, and you do know some people say, I don't want to even rise no more. But turn to him. He is the one who can take your heart. People's hearts are heavy. They have no peace. They have no contentment. They're depressed. They have sadness. They have lonely. They have floods. They have earthquakes. They have everything going against them. And yet, you know, in all of this, they haven't turned to him. But you know, in Job, Job or sorry, Joel, chapter 1, if you read it, um, I was looking through it there one night and I wrote down some points. It's interesting that in Joel's day in Judah that the Lucas come in and they ate all the vine and then the cranker worm come in and ate what's left and they devastated the whole area and the whole place went into a famine. It ate everything and destroyed and people had no food and no, everything was, they were coming in their own number. They couldn't and destroyed everything in the vines. They wrecked and ate everything that it says there in one of the verses they had teep, uh, teeth just as sharp as lions and they had the bark they had everything destroyed the vines wrecked everything and it had to be born but you know what the end of that is if you get into chapter two do you know what they've done it's only then when the lord that they cried to the lord to help them in their time of need you know some people have to go a long way down before they can look up sometimes if they put it in their back before they cry on to him and that has happened many times uh, as through Scripture. Even when Noah was the man for the flood, the people wouldn't listen to him to get in and they could be saved. Also, 
David in the Psalms was the same. You know, we cried to the Lord. We all need help, no matter who we are. You can put on the best dress, you can look, a smile, you can break, but you can have the, a breaking heart that only you know, and the one in heaven knows today. He knows what your heart is like. We can lose all in a moment, and many have, and many will. I was in Romania a few years back, and the day I arrived, the floods hit, and I seen houses going down there. I never seen it in my life. Actually, we get floods here, but you've never seen houses. But I've seen literally bridges just going away, houses going down the rivers, cattle, everything. And nobody could do nothing about it because of the force of water. No, he is our help in a present time of trouble. He's all we have. He's all we can do. There's no one else when all is against us. Psalm 34 and verse says, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me out of all my fears. I mean, I, as I have done this over 30 years in Romania and Moldova and Ukraine, I've seen tragedy. I've seen heartbreak. And you know, you come on the area, people will direct you to these people and that people who have nothing and houses. I've seen houses, as I say, washed away. I've seen uh, people left with no uh, mother and father. I've seen children going to orphanages. I've seen circumstances where in fact, me and Michael, before he passed away, went around houses and lifted children always in that week of September and put them in to their money bus and drive them away to an orphanage and they'd be there then until the following summer. It must break your heart. And the only reason is they can't afford to keep them. And this was a better life that the children went to an orphanage because they got food, they got learning. Also, they learned, they got school and everything free. It's sad, but it was the best. But it's hard to see a mother and a grandmother come out to hand their child over and the tears stop them. But this is what happens in this world today. Though the earth be moved, the mountains shake, I am here. Nations rage, trouble everywhere. God is in the midst. People are fearful when they seem there's nothing they can do. They have no hope. Many today in our cities, in our towns, have no hope. They're looking for it in different ways. Drugs, drink, whatever way they are. They'll never find peace. The only one place they can find it is in God. When we can do little, you know, when the storms of life come by, he is sovereign. He's Lord of creation, and his word is in heaven and will ever stand. Verse 8 says, Let all the heavens of the world stand in awesome. That's in Psalm 33. Philippians chapter 2, 9 and 10 says, Therefore God has has highly exalted, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, and give him a name which is above every name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee one day shall bow. I tell you, if you don't bow and ask him to save you, one day you'll bow before him. It doesn't matter who you are. The highest man, the richest man, the king, the queen, the president of this world will one day bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. Hearts are heavy. Hearts are broken, especially in Ukraine at this time. I've seen them. They are in desperate needs. Some of them are so solemn that they can't even speak to you. They're cried out. They don't want to cry. Children, you can see it on their faces. And it's usually all women because the men have gone to the front line to the war. And the boys and over 18 and 19 have gone. I've talked to mothers, um, maybe in their 40s, two sons uh, down on the front line and this woman told us that her sons were captured by Russia. They're somewhere in Russia. She doesn't know if they're dead or alive. And her heart is breaking. And she says, what can I do? And you know, there's hundreds of stories like that. I was getting, uh, this telling, they were telling, you know, talking among themselves and uh, one of my child's boys were translating. They were telling stories. I had to grab a pen and write it as rough as I can because the heartbreak and the abuse of especially mothers and children walking through for maybe three or four days, bare feet, some of them shoes fell off them, to try to get to the border of either Moldova, Romania, or Poland. Why? It's a place of safety. It's the same as the psalmist says. We need to go to a place of safety. And that's what's their aim. And they come to the border, and it was hard. And the abuse that some of these young ladies and girls, as they were captured by soldiers, went through is unbelievable. You can only think. With the stories they told. They've lost everything. Met a woman, 
I would say she was in her late 70s, 80s. And she had a wee farm. She lost all her animals. She lost her farm. She lost her house. Everything. Bombs went off around it. And one had it beside her. And she just ran out of the house one night with what she had on her. She left her glasses. She left her watch. She left everything. And she ran till she got somebody to give her a lift. Somebody to give her a lift to another town, another city. And she moved on until she came onto this church where she is now. And you'll see it in the photos, some of the photos. There's, there's 185 children in this one. There's another one with 280. And all these children are here because the men are on the front line working and the mothers are somewhere else. It's so sad. And yet this little woman, she's an Orthodox woman. She's not a Christian. But every day, to pass the time, she sits and she's reading through the Bible. And when she finishes, she just goes through it again. They have churches here. In Ukraine, Cornell was at them. I wasn't at, I was at some of the churches, but I wasn't at this one. He was at one in Kiev, outside Kiev, and they take stuff there. That's why we were doing. We're taking stuff over. And in this church, there is over now 2,000 people trying to get into it, as well as people standing outside. Why? Because there's no one else can meet their need. And I'd ask you today, after you see these slides, if you would promise God one thing, is pray for the people of Ukraine three times at least, or twice a day, morning and night, that peace would come to Ukraine and Russia. Some of the Russian soldiers don't want it either because it's like, if you can imagine here in Donegal and up in the north, you know, there are families who are connected both up on both sides of the border, and yet, you know, they're fighting each other. I hear the story of a mother, uh, two, two, uh, two sisters, <coughs> One sister lives in Russia and there's a family in Russia and one lives in Ukraine. And they phone each other every day and say, how are you? Are you still there? You know, and it's so sad. And that's the problem, back and forward. The war has torn them. And if you put it right down, it's sin is the problem. Greed and sin is the problem. And it started in the Garden of Eden. And that's the outfall. And that's because that's why we shall earn our sweat or work by the sweat of our brow. Hearts are heavy, hearts are their own. Families are torn apart. Young people have to go to help in different uh, areas of life, and they're trying their best, and they're coming across no work, they have no money, they have nothing with them. All they come with is what they have. One family had come to my cell, stayed in one room in his house uh, for three weeks, and they wouldn't even come out of the room. They were that badly shocked, and they even kept the blinds down it was only give them the food at the door until they have that fear on them that they think when they're coming to Romania and Moldova that they can't trust them. They think that they're uh, kind of, if you can imagine, they're getting set up for something that it could be something that they're setting walking into. They think it's like uh, in the war times in Germany that they're going to be taken away. And yes, but no, when they see the kindness of the Christians, and I tell you that the Christian churches from the 24th of February have went out and out. And I mean, they've been cooking every day uh, from 6 in the morning, meals, right through till about 10 or 11 at night. They've been trying to get beds. They've tried to keep people. They've tried to entertain. They've tried to help them. All the churches in Romania and the people that I've worked with, there's five van loads. They are doing their best. And right across, all the churches are, have done everything and pouring in as much money and food for it takes a lot to take across and also for the people that are escaping this situation. It's very sad when you see people at this uh, time. As many have said, in February, at the start of February, everything was rosy like here. On the 23rd of February, they were going about their business and shopping. On the 24th of February, their world changed and fell apart. And all we can do is pray that things would change and that God would come and help them in their time of need. You know, no matter what, one day, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, one day will break the sky. God says his son is coming back for his church. For those who are saved, he's coming to the air, the trumpet will sound, it'll be the biggest disaster of the world. Because you think if everyone is saved, they're driving a bus or a plane or cars or whatever thing, as soon as the trumpet goes, they'll be meet him in the sky. What a day. Didn't the hymn writer get it right when he says, he's the lily of the valley, and also one of the favorite ones that I quote, 
What a friend we have in Jesus. Where have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. There's two churches that I was visited there in Ukraine. One has a prayer meeting since the 24th of February, and it runs every morning from seven days a week, every morning from seven in the morning to nine. The other church in the same city has a gospel outreach from the 24th of February, seven days a week, from uh, six at night to eight, and they're ongoing and they're packed. Why? Because this is what people have no one else to turn to, because burdens are lifted at Calvary. Days are filled with sorrow and care. Hearts are lonely and drear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. You know, that's all we can do is cast our burdens on the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. For it's appointed unto man a day in which, it's because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world of righteousness, and by that man he hath ordained. You know, we can, they're losing all. We could lose all very quick. Come to me, all ye that are heavy laden. What does Jesus say? And I will give you rest. Trust me, give your heart. And it's true in the words of the Gator song. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. Christ holds the future. He knows what's going to happen tomorrow. Life is worth a living just because he loves. Ask the Lord Jesus Christ into your heart and life and trust him for today. Thank you. I'm going to start the PowerPoint now and I'll see how it goes here. Just Quite a few wee slides here that Rebecca helped me with. So we'll just keep your eye on it rather than me explain it and you will see. Uh, this is a map of Romania and you can see on the right, if you look across, you will, maybe I'm better down here. You can see on the right there where you go across here is Moldova and right around it is uh, Ukraine. Goes right up around, right down. It hugs right around the top of Romania and then right the whole way right around uh, Moldova and there's Odessa at the bottom. And we go, I went to Moldova, both north and south, and Odessa's only 150 kilometers uh, from where uh, Cornell and them people are, work, are, where Mattel and Dan's boys are working. This is Ukraine, there is Romania, and there is Moldova, and you can see that we're very, we're sitting on the border. In fact, the house that I go to in Mattel's is Siret, and uh, it's only less than two kilometers to the border. You wonder why I took a letter, uh, this photo here, this lady was, um, I was in the plane going out of Dublin, and I says, Lord, just maybe give me somebody to sit beside from Ukraine, but we're flying to Romania, and likely be all Romanians on it. But, or I don't like, it's great if you can get the two seats or three seats, you know, but it's usually packed, them planes get out. But, come to the end, there were nobody sitting beside me, and just the last minute, this lady came up and says, uh, this is a seat here uh, for me and my number. And so I put her on the inside. And we're talking along. So I didn't say very much, but they come down with a coffee and all. And she asked for a cough or for a little Kit Kat. You know the two bars? She says that there. And I seen her. She was muddling around trying to get you know, pence or whatever she had. And she tried to pay for it. And then she says, could I change it? So she asked the girl, she had broken English, she says, could I change it? She was Ukrainian, could I change this for a coffee? But they wouldn't change it. He says, no. So I said, excuse me. I says, could I have a copy and you give that woman a coffee and her Kit Kat? And so she took it. So then the thing that she's holding is a thing we're doing for a church where Blaze goes around the country. That's just by the way. But finally then she said, thank you very much. It's very kind of you for having got money. I says, where are you from? She says, I'm from Kiev in Ukraine and I'm going back home. My mother and father are there and apparently we've lost a lot of stuff and I'm heading home. So we chatted back and forth. She asked me what I was doing. So it gave me the opportunity to tell her what I was doing in Romania and Moldova and Ukraine. But at the same time, I'm not going through the whole thing. But as we landed, she, I, it was about after 11 or something, Romanian time. Uh, she says, I wonder where I get a bus. I says, where are you going? 
Ukraine. I said, you'll not get a bus from Romania to Ukraine because there's nobody going there. And she didn't know what to do. There's no place out there to stay. And I said, just you, as I, you follow me, lift your bag, you follow me out. These boys out here who come to lift me, they will give you a lift to the border. That's where I'm going to the border because I stay on the border of uh, Romania and Ukraine. So I said to you and L and they, uh, what he come was there. I said, this lady coming, she's going to Ukraine. She'll get no bus. Can she go with us? Yes. Put her on and off we went. And we says, you'll not get nothing at the Ukraine border tonight. You know, it'll be, no, it'll be closed. So what they done, for a long story short, we took her there. We, uh, the, the little flat, the church in Surrette has a flat. They put her up in the flat that night and they asked her what time would the boys like to, could come in the morning and lift her. So they come at a half five in the morning. They lifted her and they took her to the border and left her on the border of Romania that she could walk across and then she'd get the first people likely lift her in Ukraine. And she says to them, she says, I can't believe how good you, what else? He says, we're Chris. You bought me coffee and paid for the thing. This man helped me to get a lift. You take me uh, about likely 35, 40 miles free. You give me a flat to stay in and they give her a Bible. And then they come in the morning, at half hour in the morning, and take her to the border. And you know, I believe God, it wasn't a mistake. God had a plan in that as he works. And we pray for, this is Junel, the boy that I work with. And this is the children's camp. The first day we were there, children's camp uh, just set up. This was a half nine in the morning. They're only coming. Usually about 200 comes every morning. They come from 10 o'clock till a half five. And again, this is, uh, they do a tent mission for three days. They move into near a tent. Then three days, again, tent. Three mo- they move different areas. And this is us meeting the people. Again, this is in the village. They uh, go around the people in Romania and through the mountain areas as we meet. This is the stuff that we buy every day. It costs a lot of money, big money. But we buy it because Romanians in Europe and they pay big prices now. So we have to buy this and we package and put it into things. This is the houses that we meet. Just keep your eyes on for sake of time. There's quite a few. I want to get into Ukraine. This is the houses and the people that we come. And you know this, they're very willing and helpful for us as we go around the houses and give out gifts. And you'll see the man there, uh, it's along with me, he's given the gospel tract. We still use the same tract by no grant. Let him in. Uh, because this has went out. I remember taking out ordering 10,000, then we had to come back and order 100,000, and then they've ordered quarter of a million. But every couple of years or so, they order another 100,000. Now they have them in Ukraine and everywhere, so they're going in everywhere, that track. By one day, I decided that I would take it, and then we translated it ever since. Just as we go around, the people that we meet, and again, as you stop along the road, people will stop to you, the man on the bicycle, the little one on the back of the bicycle in the basket as they travel for goods or whatever they're going about in their business. And again, as we get into villages, people come out to see what they have and what you're giving them. And you can see the little tracks that they'll get along with the foods and the rice and the pasta and different things. You know, I love going to villages, especially the poor villages and different areas like this because they have very little and they're very pleased with what. As for God, his ways are perfect. Again, in the churches, this is in Romania. Um, nearly, I would say every two weeks, there's always people getting baptized, immersing, because they've been saved in the last month or maybe six months or so. And the churches on a Sunday morning are pretty well full, as you can see, and in the evening also. Just to let you see some of the churches on that area of Suchava and around that area. Again, they're just the same as ourselves, they sing and... The uh, churches take the same uh, thing. Again, this is a camp, and it's in Romania, but it's very, very poor. Children that they brought, they've got these uh, little club uh, outfits for them. And the boy in the middle is John Lurka. I'll tell you a quick story. I met him one time by accident, but not really accident, when I look back. I met him in my chairs one night he called in. We walked, this would be about 10, 12 years ago, we walked to the top of the street, uh, he says, I'm, he was turning right, I was turning left, about 11 o'clock or half 11 one night, and we were chatting, and he says, I was supposed to get into Ukraine, but I don't know if I'll be going. He says, I'm at, it was a Bible college. Oh, I says, right. So I felt that I should put my hand in my pocket, and I gave him a gift of money. I didn't hear much from him, and 
and it was the first time I met him. We're very close friends now. We talk every week. He went and he wrote me a letter. It must have come about three or four months after that. A lovely letter I have in the house. He says, when I was talking to you, I went to Bay of God. I was going to Romania and I was going to the border. But I said to God, this is it. Because the next morning was a day at six o'clock I was to get into Ukraine. But I hadn't the money for a visa. I hadn't the money for a bus. I hadn't the money for a train. And I was touring around the whole of Ukraine. And I was doing children's work and mission work. But I had no money. So the thing stopped. He says, that night when people asked me, I says, I don't know. I may be going no farther. And that gift that I gave him at a half eleven that night was able to say to him on the Sunday, the next morning, to go to Ukraine and pay for his, va- uh, his visa, pay for his bus, pay for his train, and do the two weeks mission and bring him back. At the last minute, he just and then we're very close friends. He works in Moldova now uh, uh, with um, uh, Matthew and them and CMI missions. This is him here doing little camps. Great fella. He'd always like to come back here to see. And this is a trampoline. They had no trampoline for these kids. Some of them are gypsies. So they asked, would I buy that trampoline? So I give money towards a trampoline for them at the camp again. This is an orphanage up in Sachava. The, the, this is it here. And Paul knows out in Buttershan. This is Christy, the man that owns it here. This is a new one that we have. Everybody has put money on. We have put money on it. Your money has went on to help it. And they were so pleased with everything. Because this, they said at the start, they needed this orphanage, but the problem was they'd never have the money. The board said they'd never have the money to build it. But they went to see about it, and they asked the man to draw the plans, and he says it'd be 8,000 pounds, 8,000 euros, and they couldn't afford that. But they met somebody else, and they told them to go to this man, and he drew the plans free. Cut the long story short, they met another person, and they gave them the blocks free, they got the tin free, they got the glass free, most of it. But then, sadly, there, it's 2 in September, they had an electrical fault in the roof, and you can see the place went in fire. And that's him there with his hand. He is desperate. <laughs> the fire started, and within, I'd say, 10 or 15 minutes, he's on the phone to me. <laughs> I thought he had phoned him. And he says, Wolves, I've lost in my orphanage. I'm in tears. And this is him here. So we hope to get it back again as, uh, as it took. The roof was damaged and badly damaged and other things. This is us crossing now. You're going into Moldova. This is the borders. We have been through Romania border. Just, and now we're in through Moldova border where we'll be checked. I just get a glimpse there as they go through. Moldova, we took out a lot of fire engines. I think it's eight or nine. And it's worked in the area and give them a chance to go to the government. They work with the police. They work with Moldova. They work big with the police, the education board, and the government. And they all call in nearly every day. So the camp is going really good here and working well. Again, this is one of the fire engines that we took out. And as Dave Allen, a boy that was in the fire brigade, took out, this is us visiting some houses. This is the camps that they had there just there in July. They run for seven weeks. The camps run for the children's. And they run from half nine in the morning till half five. So they bring a children, say, we'll bring the children from Rafo for a week. And they come here every day for a week from the Monday until the Friday, and then parents come. So they have about 270, 280 children coming that week, and then they have a parents' night. And then they uh, do that there. So they have children finish that week. So they'll bring them next week from a different area, from orphanage. Next week it'll come from a Russian area. Next week it'll come from the refugees. So that runs for seven weeks right through. It's hard work, but they do it. This is all the different teams. They put them up on there, the different flags. This is again, this is the only half of them in the morning, the first morning that they started off to see how they would go as they all piled in. Their first song was, I keep a flag flying high. And this is them again in that area. Again, you can see the children as evening as they sing their ver- uh, songs and learn their memory verses. They come around and get their booklets and take them home with them. Again, as I say, the police and the fire brigade come in one day and give them demonstrations, different things. And this is the, the vine. Again, there are these people here working away as we meet people in the areas then, as we go out around the areas and meet them in Moldova. The very poor people in the fields, in the gardens, and along the road as we pull in to meet them and help them at this time. Again, we meet people like this. We have very little. The houses are falling around them. No health service. Just look after yourself. If you can pay to go to see a doctor, you see him. If you don't, if you pay for medicine. This is what it costs. 
That is the way they live. Children like this, very, very poor. But again, they're very rich, easy rich with the gospel, and we thank you for them. Pray for them. Help them as we travel through Moldova. The wee boxes in the corner are children's beds. That's where they sleep at night uh, in this house. This is the Russian team. And uh, they didn't know they're all Christians, and they are helping in the outreach. I went with them a few days back and forward. They went to the refugees in Ukraine. They were a bit huffy the first few times they built it up. And they didn't know if they'd come to the camp, but they did. And their mothers and parents also came to the camp. This is them speaking to some of the refugees who have in the old flats. They put them in the old flats in Moldova, and they're there now staying again as we met them and helped them. This man in the middle is a Russian. He's an evangelist. And the two girls became Christians, were saved that morning on the first day of the camp, and they're Ukrainians. Again, this is them at an evening. They come out and they can lift the literature free, whatever they want. Matthew is in the middle here, this is the director. This is the camp now, they have it all up. Volleyball, table tennis, football, swim pool, everything is there. Now as we go into Ukraine, the queue in Ukraine and Romania is over 30 miles long. But from here to Ukraine, and them lorry men have to sit there as they check one lorry in. And it's the same queue to get out. uh, We get through on the other side, but this is the queues that these men have to wait. They reckon it takes them seven to eight days to move from where they start queuing till they get to the border and then to go on. So I don't know how to do it, but this is the way it is. This is the border of Ukraine. The photos are not so good because they're taken through the one screen. It wouldn't be advisable, luckily, put the camera out. So we just snap them. Uh, me and some of the boys snap them. Depends. We have four vans. There's another one in front and one with a trailer as we travel through Ukraine and different areas. You'll see the checkpoints. You'll see that there. They give you a password as you pass one, and then you keep a password as you go right through them. Again, in the shopping centers in this area. Uh, I'll tell you one thing. Um, I thought I'd have heard that some boys say, Ukrainians are hard, fast drivers. <laughs> if I told you the, the speed them boys do is unbelievable on the roads, and uh, it's just unbelievable as we travel right through Ukraine into these churches we give because they have the point of meeting people and also some families we stop with and also in some areas as uh, we meet people who are unwell, they have certain points that they can meet as they travel through. Again, children, you'd wonder where they get the smile for the camera and you're sitting in a situation like this. This is the people that we try to help and bring good. You'll not see very many men because you're not, it's all the children and the women. This is all the kids sleeping at night, they're in, they, all, they all sleep just more or less, put on your mattress and lie down. That's what they have, and that's what they're doing since February. Again, you can tell by her face, my world has fallen apart. I don't need to say any more if you look at her face. And it's great to help uh, people who are in need. This little boy's handicapped, and that's the mother there. And they're grateful for what they get and receive. But we'd ask that you pray that this thing would come. This is one of the churches. And they have another building, exactly the same on the other side, and it's full of kids, 185 kids on here. We bring about two or three, la- uh, they come three times a week with two van loads here for food, and they meet a lot of people in this area. Again, children like us here as we travel through the villages and meet them. This is the team that I was with here. The girl in the red is a customs officer, but she's just retired, and she works with the stuff and gets it to the front line, to the, the soldiers on the front line that need the food, and also to the people who are elderly, who are living in the places where the war is going on, who are housebound, who are not going to move, who can't move, have no care, and they just live there and hope that a bomb doesn't hit their house. They're just staying there. And this girl is coordinating the stuff down onto the front line. This is some of the places we take the stuff, and you can see the soldiers there, again, happy to get anything that they do, whether they're at the checkpoints or wherever, they come across them on these rules. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with my eye. Again, her face is all. You see, it's so sad that their country has been torn apart. Again, this is us loading a store all the way down in the middle of Ukraine. And there's a, a places like this here. And you'll see the people then as we visit the houses, some individual houses we're told to go to, and we go around and give them the stuff. This is cooks. I was telling you about, they cook every day. 
since the war started. Every day meals, every day in the kitchen. One day after the war, all meals are cooked, and these ones here are doing the cooking. This is where some of the stuff is left, and the people come off the street and queue to get in. So where children like these here are. This is some of the villages. Again, the food, this is where we're buying it in bulk as we take it out and put it into the vans. This is the vans that we use and we travel in. Again, and this is the queue for the people going into the church as uh, for the services that I told you about. These people here came from Mullapole. They lost everything. They were some, some of the families were staying down in the steel, the steel factories. They were telling us they were all down underneath the ground and they were there for seven and eight weeks and children, and there used to be old rags and old curtains down there, and they cut the rags and they cut the curtains to make children's nappies. And they have no water, so they drink the water out of the heating system or out of the big iron pipes that's been lying there. That's all they have. And they found out that when they come out, they can't see their eyes. There's something wrong with their eyes, suppose of the darkness. But I remember one lady telling us, they were, people says, why don't you come out? And they run. They, they're that fearful. For four men one time went out, to get groceries for the children and that there. And as they ran out to shop, the Russian soldiers shot the four of them dead. So uh, it was very sad, and that's the fear. So that's why they stayed down. But these people have got out. These people here are crossing in wheelchairs across the border. Again, this is us uh, delivering stuff here. And these girls here are, are taking the stuff onto the store, and they're keeping it here, and they're putting it down, and they get down onto the boys and also the front line and they do the villages around that area where it's been hit by the war again and this is us leaving it off at another church you can see the van loads there as they're all parked and they're being emptied again as they move forward this is a church again and this is the boys they're all their beds and this is the girls and their, their fathers will be fighting on the front line and their mothers will be out working or doing something and they're staying in the church and it was them. This here has a great story. It was in Machels. Uh, an artist from Ukraine, she's from Kiev. They lost everything. They run for their lives. And she got to Ukraine and she says, I'm very fearful. I might as well tell you. But she's an artist and she drew this picture and she put it up on Machels' wall. And she says, I'm leaving this here. I've wrote down what she did. She says, I'm leaving this here that I'll always remember you. This is the Ukraine chorus. This is Romania. And she says, you have been so kind to us, all the people and all the Christians in Ukraine. I can't believe it. And she says, please keep this photo and I'll keep mine. And I'll always remember, if we ever meet again, it'd be good that you're welcome to Ukraine and I'd be welcome to Romania. But the two hands are together. And this will remind you every day to help us, to pray for us in this situation. Again, this is the churches. Uh, and this is only taken them in July when I was out. You can see that's only half it. They're packed right out. And I'd say, why? Because it's the only place and the only place to get run to. This woman can't go anywhere. Nowhere to run. This is what people forget. They're running to the borders. They're running by trains. But there's a lot of people who can't move. There's children in mental homes. There are different ones who can't run. Orphanages, they can't go anywhere. These two girls here are great with mission work. They've seen a great work done in going through Ukraine. And a lot of people trust the Lord as their saviour. Again, the soldiers are helping this old lady out of her house that was wrecked. And again, this is us here. Uh, as is Cornell. And you'll not see me. I'm on behind Cornell there now. He's blocking me out. But this lady is telling us the story. She has two boys. And the two boys are, were fighting in the war. And the Russian soldiers have captured them. They're, in, they're told that they're in Russia. And she doesn't know whether they have been uh, murdered or as and she might never see them again. You can tell by her face, she's heartbroken. She has a, a wee boy and a girl left, and her other two boys, uh, she doesn't know where they are tonight. And she has to live with that every day. Stop, prepare to meet thy God. Whether it's Ukraine or whether it's here, one day we have to prepare. Remember, God is still on the throne. And yes, today, today, forever, Jesus is the same. Everything around this world has changed. All my change. But Jesus will never glory to his name.
give my burden as you give to me your strength come and fill me with your spirit as I sing to you this praise you deserve the greater glory as overcome my lift my voice to the king in need of nothing empty hands Deserve the greater glory as overcome with joy I sing by your love I am accepted. You're a good and gracious king. And you would see me as your child and as your friend, safe, secure in you forever. I pour out my praise again. And you deserve the greater. You're a good and gracious king. 